I'm going to try to make this as applicable to the folks who are actually in the room. And I think um, I've been informed that you guys are like primary care providers who are interested in um, epilepsy. And so this is kind of a, a tool that we've been using at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas uh, for children of all types of epilepsy that is um, poorly controlled and are being considered for surgical evaluation. And part of that subgroup are these children who have hypothalamic hamartoma. So we'll talk about that today. So um, this is a uh, MRI of a child who's had uh, two surgical interventions, two types of sur surgical interventions. So you can see uh, the picture here on the left. <coughs> do I have a pointer with this? I do. Oh, yay. Uh, this child, uh, the first, uh, this is the hypothalamic hamartoma of this child. And this child had a transcolosal approach to remove uh, this portion of the hamartoma. And the child still had um, frequent seizures and uh, came to our center uh, prior to my arrival and had a, uh, a laser ablation of this area here. After this transcolosal approach, the child had um, endocrinological uh, issues and um, some memory-related issues, but um, otherwise was the same child as before with regards to seizures. After this laser ablation, there was um, some reduction in the seizures, but they were still fairly frequent and uh, there was no change in the child's symptoms afterwards. Um, so uh, this child received a resting state functional MRI, which I'll go more into what that is, to try to determine where in that hamartoma were the seizures coming from. If we had already placed two holes and it didn't seem to have that much of an effect, could we use, could something in science out there possibly give us some information about where to go next? Um, if we try to remove the entire hamartoma, we've learned that um, that places the child at the greatest risk for further memory issues and uh, possibly cognitive decline and uh, uh, other related issues. So uh, a minimally invasive approach is uh, ideal with regards to safety of the child and uh, lack of further degeneration. So um, what the resting state showed, and I'll go into more detail about how did it show this, is that this area of the hamartoma on the exact opposite side of what um, had been targeted previously was the area that the seizures were coming from and uh, emanated out over the brain to where the EEG detected most of the um, epileptiform activity to be onto the opposite side of the brain. So it was counterintuitive in this child that the seizures were coming from this side of the hamartoma and then emanating out over the left side, uh, but that is what is detectable by resting state functional MRI. So I'm going to go back to um, a more traditional functional MRI, what most folks know when you think of functional MRI. Uh, there'd be a normally intelligent adult placed in a regular MRI scanner, and then we ask that adult to perform a task, and then we measure the brain's uh, activity before and after that task, and then we simply subtract out those two activities, what was before, what was after, and then we see what lights up on the scanner. Uh, so if we ask that adult to open and close their eyes, then the visual cortex will be what lights up before and after. And we can watch the uh, signal, which I'll go into more about what is that signal that we're watching with eyes open, eyes closed, on and off like this. We just watch it go, go, go over time. Uh, and so these types of validation studies in normally intelligent adults have taught us that um, this signal that we're seeing is related to the function going on in the brain. Um, but um, the problem for children is that they, uh, especially those who have epilepsy, uh, have a very difficult time performing such perfect tasks uh, in an MRI scanner environment uh, due to anxiety, claustrophobia, inability to sit still. Uh, even moving past a millimeter disrupts the ability to detect this activity reliably. Uh, and so, uh, moving past task-based, uh, the next generation of functional MRI is really resting state functional MRI in which uh, any person who's capable of being in a scanner, even under light general anesthesia uh, and staying still, uh, which is pretty much anyone who's healthy enough to withstand standard scanner conditions, uh, even my ICU patients who are in a coma can withstand this uh, under close supervision by anesthesia. Uh, can we 
put them in a scanner and then watch their brain activity from all areas of their brain. No area of the brain is ineligible for monitoring. And we can watch the same signal from any area of the brain undulate slowly over time. These are seconds here. And this is the signal coming from that area of the brain. And we can just sit there and watch. Every network of the brain can show up, and we can analyze that network and uh, query it and see if it, uh, the time course of that signal from that area of the brain is occurring normally or not normally. Uh, and so this is what is known as resting state functional MRI. And this has been validated uh, from centers all over the world with thousands of patients replicating the same brain networks that we know already exist from many different modalities. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, the children at Texas Children's Hospital who uh, do not have epilepsy, and their brain networks look the same as all other humans, uh, in that uh, the slow undulating pattern that we described before is captured, um, and there, this is a, uh, so this is the time course of uh, an example of one of the uh, networks. And um, this graph down here uh, shows where, uh, at what frequency is most of that signal from that network, and it's a low frequency. This is 0.03 hertz, if you will. So these are just ways of quantifying that signal's uh, characteristics. Uh, from any um, network of the brain. So what you see over here is all of the main uh, brain, large-scale cortical brain networks um, that can be measured by resting state functional MRI. Uh, and so this is an example, uh, a paper published sometime back, this was 2009, of all those large-scale brain networks. And what are they responsible for uh, in looking at um, a meta-analysis of um, thousands of articles of those networks and what do they do. Um, and um, so you could say, so here, like for example, here's like perception, somatesthesia, and um, that would be from network six, and then come back here to network six, and you can see what location uh, that. So what do the, what are these networks do? And that's just quantifying that, just to get a better idea of what, what it is that we do. And so these are um, an example of an article um, looking at all the studies from um, places all over the world. It's not dependent on what location you live in uh, on Earth or uh, what type of scanner was used, whether it was a Siemens or a GE scanner that we received. This. So it's like a standard, uh, standardization of these results, if you will. And then also, does, uh, how does this correlate with when brain networks come online, if you will, during the course of uh, brain development? And so the large-scale brain networks start to become detectable by resting state functional MRI as early as 29 weeks of gestation. Uh, and so these are uh, infants that were born early and scanned uh, in, in the uh, neonatal ICU. And then over time, the development of that brain network across um, hundreds of um, neonates. Uh, and so uh, th the emergence of these um, resting state networks correlates with our prior knowledge of um, brain network development over development, over the period of uh, just, I mean, gestation and so forth. Um, so this is just an example from Texas Children's Hospital of the um, anesthesia that's given during a resting state functional MRI. So if you will, your brain is always on until you die or become brain dead, or we turn your brain off with general anesthesia. So if we dose the child with anesthesia, typical for deep anesthesia as such you would give for like say an appendectomy or something like that, uh, then we will not be able to detect the brain networks. Uh, so we do have to be very careful about how much anesthesia we give. Um, in the past, um, at Texas Children's, we've been using uh, propofol, um, but we have some experience with other anesthetics. Um, you know, depending on the child and what the child will tolerate. Um, but at any rate, it's the same uh, amount of anesthesia, more or less, as what you would say to have your wisdom tooth taken out, you know, in your dental office. <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to say another word about um, what does corrupt the um, detection of the networks. If the child moves back and forth, say it's with snoring or head nodding, um, then uh, the detection of the networks will be much less reliable. Um, if, if my anesthesia tech is new and they put the motor of the IV uh, pole too close to that scanner, I'm going to get vibration. And so I have to pay attention to all of that to make sure that um, 
we get proper uh, acquisition of our uh, MRI. Um, also, registering that activity to the brain's uh, anatomy is very important to do reliably. These are all just sort of technical issues related to this. Um, and then there is a lot of noise. Um, so this is a part of, of what we expect with resting state functional. We're going to detect everything going on in that scanner, including what's happening in the CSF spaces, in the arteries, in the veins, and all of that has to be taken into account and denoised out of the signal. Um, so I'm just going to run you quickly through uh, a typical child's, uh, a typically developing child's uh, resting state. So here are the motor networks. Up here is the face, the hand networks, the leg network. These are the language-related networks. Uh, this child has left-dominant related language. These are the language networks on the right side of the brain from that child. Um, this is a, a, a parietal um, secondary association network that um, talks to the SMA network. Uh, these are the frontal networks from that child. Uh, this is the um, temporal occipital um, conjunction network. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the primary visual networks, secondary visual association networks, um, the deep gray networks, which typically I'll detect a bilateral putamen network. Uh, this is the default mode network, which uh, is a modulating network of all the other networks. And uh, these are the long-range association networks, which typically I'll detect in children who have an IQ above 70. Uh, so in order to study the hypothalamus, which is very deep in the brain, um, first what I do is detect... Um, detect all the major brain networks in any given child. So um, in order to understand how the seizures propagate out of the hypothalamus, the first step is what we do is um, bring all of the children who, who at the point of the time of this study, who we studied with hypothalamic hamartoma, where were the general patterns of the um, activity outside of the hypothalamus different from normal? So first, detecting all of the major brain networks. In children with hypothalamic hamartoma, all of their major brain networks are detectable. Um, and so this, the, here's where their group networks in, in 15 children with hypothalamic hamartoma. And then what we did was taking um, the, the signal um, in their entire brain and then subtracting it from controls, what areas of the brain turned out to have difference from normal. And those are what you see here. And then um, the next step was to ask ourselves, then how, is, uh, how are these areas of the brain way outside of the hypothalamus, how is that related to the hypothalamus itself, or the, ham the hamartoma, rather? Uh, so that was step three of this study. So all those areas of difference uh, uh, across the entire brain, and how are they different related to the activity, the resting state signal from the hamartoma itself? And um, it turned out that uh, the areas that you're looking at here um, had a statistical, um, signi statistically significant difference um, with their activity in relationship to the hamartoma as opposed to the other areas. There were 13 areas originally detected that were different across the entire brain, uh, but these are the areas shown here um, that were different um, in relation to the activity in the hypothalamus, uh, hamartoma itself. Uh, so this is important because, you know, we look at our EEG and we say, well, you know, this child may have ictal activity on the EEG. Um, you know, suppose that we detected, you know, the EEG can show us the very top surface of the brain. We could see there was a difference in that, say, a particular child here. But we wouldn't necessarily be able to see any of these deep centers of the brain um, ictal activity because the EEG can only measure the last few millimeters of the outside um, cortical folds. Um, so using other modalities to help us understand how ictal activity spreads from the hamartoma to other areas of the brain can help us understand when we're measuring differences, could that be from seizure versus um, something else? Uh, so this is an actual patient with a hamartoma's resting state functional MRI, and uh, the uh, two most abnormal signal sources from this particular patient are shown here. And remember earlier I showed you a slow undulating pattern. So this is an erratic 
Uh, it has some undulation to it, but you can see there, there it's more uh, spike-like, if you will, and um, there's changes to the oscillating pattern that you don't see in typical um, resting state signal sources. And also, this power spectrum of those frequencies leaks out into higher frequencies. Um, so that's true with um, both of these signal sources. And also, um, compared to normal, um, I would not detect <coughs> this spatial distribution of signal source. Um, so this was an abnormal signal source for this child. And same with uh, this, the spatial pattern of this signal source is not typically detected. <coughs> So, but that doesn't mean that's where the seizure is coming from. That just means that this is an abnormal signal source for this child. <clears throat> so what we need to do next is then say, how does that relate to the hamartoma itself? So with the resting state data, taking all the noise out of it and understanding what is actual signal, then we can put it through a secondary step of processing in which we um, ask ourselves, if I place a seed here in the hamartoma itself, how will that one cubic millimeter within that hamartoma relate to the rest of the brain? And will it also correlate with those abnormal signal sources for that particular child? And in this case, for this child, <coughs> if you remember that original graphic, uh, this child's um, seed showed abnormal activity fanning out over the right side of the brain that you see here. And um, so that particular seed uh, right there in the middle of the hamartoma uh, was the most likely area by resting state functional right of where the um, seizure source is coming from. And so is a targetable lesion for minimally invasive surgery. Um, and so every cubic millimeter of that hamartoma can be individually queried uh, for its relationship to the rest of the brain using this type of data and uh, be potential uh, target sources for minimally invasive surgery and potential cure for that child. <clears throat> uh, so here is the same child after that area was targeted by uh, stereotactic laser ablation and um, the uh, post-operative uh, uh, one week later resting state showed um, no uh, correlation between um, anywhere and within that hamartoma to the rest of the brain. And normally there is a honeymoon period after any surgical intervention uh, for seizures in which the child just doesn't have seizures. And so one week post-op uh, doesn't mean a whole lot with long-term um, seizure quiescence. Uh, the same child six months later um, shows the same relation. This is um, only noise here. This is not actual activity. Um, so querying the same, you know, all of the areas within the hamartoma, uh, the child was still seizure-free, and so the resting state for this child um, correlated with the seizure freedom that you see here. Um, I wanted to say a few words, if we have time, we still have time, about um, the actual pathways out of the uh, hamartoma areas to the rest of the brain. Um, we do know a little more about brain networks than we used to 10 years ago. Uh, and um, multimodality data, um, <clears throat> both by you know, looking at white matter tract and uh, MRIs, um, pathological studies, things like this, uh, we can um, look at where um, out of the um, hamartoma area all of the normal brain networks go to and um, use that to help us understand the manifestations that we see with seizures. So let's take something very simple, like if we have a tonic, um, clonic seizure coming from the hand area on the left side of the brain, we would expect the right hand to shake and um, become have tonic clonic activity because we know the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and so forth. So if a seizure is coming out of the hamartoma, what clinical manifestation would we have? Um, it might not be obvious at all. In fact, we do know that within hamartomas, the lesions that um, areas where um, seizure activity is coming from, we don't see some change specific to what's happening down here on the EEG, because as we mentioned before, the EEG is only measuring the outside of the brain. But as that act seizure activity moves out of the hamartoma and ping-pongs around the brain, we will see all of the manifestations that you will see in children during the times of their seizures. So which area of the brain it's activating, 
will cause the symptoms that you see in that particular child with the seizures. Uh, so um, <clears throat> there's two, um, I'm, I'm going to pause to make a short segue into what the difference in emotional lability and pathologic laughter and crying. With emotional lability, um, this is more of a psychiatric um, problem um, that, or say problem, but actually a common manifestation across all of humanity, if you will. Whereas is a pathologic laughter and crying um, happens when there is a, um, a lesion within the brain. Uh, it's not necessarily specific to hypothalamic hematoma. You could have this, um, what's, this is known as pseudobulbar palsy. Uh, you could have it in ALS with children, with folks with who have um, MS, um, and s different strokes in areas of the brain. Um, so there's two networks that control um, the expression of emotion primarily. Uh, and um, one, one, so we're going to talk about those two networks. But this is this er, this um, article that I bring up by Lauterbach. Um, um, he reviewed uh, 655 different clinical studies um, and set out criteria for you know what would be a, a valid study um, looking at these emotion control networks. Okay. And um, from these um, studies, uh, uh, he determined that there's a, this dual network system. So there's this involuntary emotional pathway and the emotional control network. So um, what you feel involuntarily and then how you control that more thinking, if you will. Um, so um, folks who are neurologists, almost kind of this is your bread and butter med student neurology right here. Um, this, this uh, adult had a stroke here uh, in the face area of his brain, and it's affecting his ability to smile symmetrically. Uh, so you can see that if you tell this man to smile, he's voluntarily controlling how he will move his face, and he's not able to smile symmetrically. But if you actually tell him a really good joke, you know, maybe a dirty joke, I don't know, <laughs> he will laugh, and he will smile symmetrically. So we know that... This involuntary aspect, if you will, we kind of have this, uh, and this is, you know, replicable upon uh, anyone who has a stroke in this area, um, that they will still smile symmetrically um, on an involuntary basis. So it's some other area of the brain besides, you know, this um, cortex um, that controls face movement that allows for that expression of that emotion. So we know it's somewhere else in the brain. Uh, so where is it? So this involuntary emotion control network um, has um, several components to it, but the final common pathway of all of these, of both the voluntary actually and the voluntary, is through the nucleus retroambiguous, which is deep in the brainstem. We know that the hypothalamus has direct connections to the nucleus retroambiguous um, here in the back of the brainstem. Um, so. From those 120 um, studies that were selected from the 655 studies of that meta-analysis, the final common pathway of all of those individuals looking at multimodality data, what was left was the nucleus retroambiguous. So it's probable that this area, if it's still connected to the child's uh, hamartoma, you can still um, have those um, Involuntary, involuntary uh, laughter or smile episodes that are not associated necessarily with um, true emotional experience versus the volitional um, uh, control network, which starts more cortically based and does not run through the hypothalamus. Um, so these areas of the brain that connect to the hypothalamus uh, that I have circled here, um, such as the anterior cingulate gyrus, the cingulate gyrus. Um, uh, these actually turned out to be those original areas that I showed you from the resting state data that are the initial areas of seizure propagation from resting state data out of the hypothalamic hamartoma and those 15 individuals analyzed in a group-wise basis. Um, and so they are part of that um, involuntary emotional control network that was determined by that multimodality data that we just discussed. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Any questions? 
I was just curious. Um, we have some parents that report children that will laugh and that vocalization you talked about from the NRA, they will laugh during a gelastic seizure, but do not laugh in a normal, what you would expect a laughing situation. You may hear a funny joke, watch cartoons. Mm -hmm. So they experience that feeling of joy or what we would think would trigger a laugh, but don't have a normal laugh. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think along that same pathway as the smile, would the laugh be along that same NRA pathway? So yes, the final common output pathway of the nu nucleus retroambiguous, the voluntary emotional control network does descend through that final nucleus before it exits um, the brain. So it is possible that the dysfunction from the emotional control network to that center of the brain could be disrupting the ability to voluntarily control it. I wouldn't know for sure. I mean, I could try querying that patient individually, and it would be interesting to see. Um, but that's that's a fascinating question. Thank you. I have a more technical question. How do you actually, in your resting state MRI, control for the depths of the anesthesia? Because I think that's quite difficult. I mean, we scan a lot of kids. Mm -hmm and we do some DTI and past MRI measurements on them, but we're never really sure, even with the anesthesiologist on site, that we really have no impact. And that's, mm -hmm. of course, if you want to, for example, compare disease uh, severity, the more severe kids will always be under sedation, while the uh, less yes. affected kids will be yeah. having no sedation. So a comparison between the group is very hard. So I was wondering, how do you control for that, that you have no impact on your data? Uh, so um, first of all, I should say that anesthesia is uh, dosed on a weight-based manner. So for a small child, it's dosed like milligrams per kilogram per minute. Uh, so there is that. Uh, and then also, if the um, large-scale cortical networks were not standardly detectable in that child, then I will just report that as a null study. So I expect in children with hypothalamic hematoma to be detect to do, be able to detect all of the large scale networks, and I can also see if it starts if the, the signal starts to come in weakly for those networks. If it's difficult to um, separate out the noise from the networks, then that uh, makes it a less reliable study. Uh, I would say in general, though, for the children with hypothalamic hematoma, I've not had any difficulty. Um, I certainly do have children who. Um, their airway is tenuous, and so in order to place a airway device to make sure that they are safe in the MRI, they generally do need deeper anesthesia, and those are the individuals in which are at the highest risk of having a resting state study that I'm not able to uh, feel at, it is as was reliably done. So if mm -hmm. I understand right, you use the other networks to basically control for your mm -hmm. hypothalamic hematoma network. But during the measure, measurement itself, you have not a lot of options to actually control whether you will have results or not. That's more like, that's correct. except for looking for the weight, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. So Thank the worst case much. scenario is the child was in the scanner for 20 extra minutes with that anesthesia with no benefit. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That, that's really fascinating, the, the way, if you, I understand correctly, the way you are trying to, to isolate in, in the mass of the hematoma, especially when the hematoma is a little bit large, what is truly the, the onset zone of the, the epilepsy. Um, from, from recordings in the hematoma with deep electrode, um, multiple deep electrode, we know that some patient can experience different kind of seizures and each of these seizures can start from a different area in the mm -hmm. hematoma. So you are performing a resting state at a specific time. You are catching a specific type of seizure. How much you can extrapolate from this the information in terms mm -hmm. of sensitivity, specificity? And mm -hmm. if I want to rephrase my question, how many of, of these patients have you done? And in, in this population of patients, in how many of these patients the, the information you, you obtained was leading us to, to, to the cure of the patient? So thank you so much for your well thought out question. Uh, first, I want to address that um, in at least 
I mean, I would say anecdotally without um, being able to look back at my data as accurately as I would like to uh, from my recall alone, at least half of the patients have more than one area in which it is very likely that seizures are coming from more than one area within the hamartoma itself. And uh, in all cases, what I will do is um, I report on every cubic millimeter of the hamartoma to the neurosurgeon of that activity from that cubic millimeter. So there'll be like, uh, say it's approximately like 200 sets of images. You saw three sets of images that I showed earlier. And, um, and then I will highlight what I suspect to be the most um, sort of uh, the most likely top two or three areas and uh, for any one individual, and then um, report on what is noise, and then what is, these are areas that seem to be quiescent. Uh, and um, Dan can speak further on this later uh, about um, what is the best approach then when you see more than one area, um, whether or not to use more than one catheter, uh, to say if it's in a different trajectory that the laser uh, would need to get at. Um, but I would say even above that, um, beyond your question, there are children in which it does seem to be that there's like a sort of a, a angrier focus, if you will, from within that hamartoma. And once uh, that area is lasered, um, certainly there is, in general, a very substantial reduction in the seizures. Um, but there can be actually that area in and of itself causing um, quiescence of what would be other seizure foci that can then um, arise later over time. So the children that, at Texas Children's, approximately 70 of them that with hypothalamic hematoma that we've been following, receive serial resting state functional MRI before and approximately six months after their scan. Um, and so um, I might have about 250 scans of children with resting state functional MRI, uh, and those would be the same children scanned multiple times. So I would say it would be typical for me to have between anywhere from one to five scans per child over time. Did I answer all of your questions? No. Okay. <laughs> well, my question is more about uh, you scan. Yeah. So sometimes you, you see or you isolate in the anatoma the, the focus for the onset dose. Um, the, you, you, you have you have the limitation of the fact that you are looking at this activity at a certain time. Oh, so, yes. Okay. So, so you may miss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You may miss something. So uh, and let, let me say that the time scale of EEG as a way of answering, which is in you know, milliseconds, which appropriate, is an appropriate measure of electrical phenomenon. I am not measuring electrical phenomenon. I am measuring the oxygen oscillation in the brain, which uh, the entire volume of the brain is scanned every two seconds. So I'm not measuring electrical phenomenon. Electrical phenomenon happening much faster. Uh, and so what I'm measuring is change in network oscillation of oxygen over time. And so this is completely different than electrical activity. But the change in the networks over time is disrupted similar to the same areas of what EEG would be able to detect, including by depth electrode. Or, or that is anecdotally what I'm telling you from my experience that I'm finding. Uh, so that what you're looking at there is not necessarily a propagating seizure that you would measure by EEG, but a propagating uh, dysfunction of uh, oscillating brain network activity by its oxygenation difference. So the child does not actually need to seize in the scanner in order for me to detect these network differences. Yes, but what you observe is the, the reflect of the... It, it, what you observe is the, the reflect of what have been this seizure activity during the last, I don't know, hours. So if mm -hmm. for several days the patient don't have a type of seizure, you may miss, uh, uh, that's just an hypothesis, you may miss uh -huh. the, the, the topography of onset of this specific type uh -huh. of seizure it was not having I would say for a while. In gen let's, I would say that yes, this is a functional <laughs> brain scan. If the brain is not having the abnormal activity during that 20 minutes, I will not be able to detect it. So that 
you know, if the child didn't smile during a picture, it doesn't mean that that child doesn't smile. It just means they didn't smile during that picture. So that is true. All right, so we're aware that this is a very new concept. And really what we think we're measuring is just conductivity. It is secondary to seizures. We don't know if that particular area of the hematoma is propagating a seizure or not, but we do know it's more connected than the other parts and it speaks to the heterogeneity. So how we use this, we know it's, you know, it's, it's new. We don't really put it as the main focus, but we do realize there's no other data that can guide us, maybe PET. So I put it into the context of my plan, but if there's some area where it's, she shows it's connected, but it's dangerous, I won't go after it. So I do put it into a, rel into a, a practical context. I don't let this drive our planning. It's just additional information that may or may not in the future prove to be effective in localizing the heterogeneity of these, of these masses. Thank you. Okay, quick comment, Jack. Quick. Actually, not a comment, but a question. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of into what you're doing um, as a tool over time. So uh, ha have, you been, have you had the opportunity to take a look at a cohort of patients uh, prior to intervention in terms of a reflection of epileptic encephalopathy or pre and post intervention in terms of a reflection of plasticity? I would dearly love to do that study and we have the data to do it but I just don't have the resources myself to look even at my own data to be able to tell you that right now and hoping to get that soon for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank mm -hmm. you.